Um, thank you for joining the Leveraging EV Infrastructure to Make Your Community a Destination webinar hosted by the North Central Texas Council of Governments and Dallas-Fort Worth Queen Cities Coalition. Um, in an effort to avoid disruptions, please mute yourself during today's presentations and type any questions you may have in the chat box. I will direct questions to each presenter following their presentation. And you're also encouraged to uh, type an introduction in the chat box. Your name and organization works great. And that way we know who all joined us this morning. So moving on to today's agenda. Um, I will kick off this webinar with an introduction on who we are in Electric Vehicle Infrastructure 101. Buzz Smith, the EV Angelist, will uh, present on electric vehicle infrastructure as a destination point. Nate Hickman, if he's here, I didn't see him in the chat bar, um, the, from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality will update us on funding opportunities for ch charging infrastructure in Texas. And Stephen Costa and Rob Hyman with the US Department of Transportation will present uh, information on their alternative fuel corridors program, funding opportunities and the Roots Initiative. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, we've allocated the last 15 minutes for open Q&A and discussion. So let's get started. So like I mentioned before, I wanted to give a quick introduction on electric vehicle charging infrastructure before we dive into the funding opportunities presented later on. So just for some background, on who we are, the North Central Texas Council of Governments is the Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, the Regional Planning Agency, and the uh, host agency for the DFW Clean Cities Coalition. The National Clean Cities Program was created by the Department of Energy in 1993 to address the requirements of the Energy Policy Act of 1992. Uh, we are part of a national network of over 100 coalitions that works to advance the nation's economic environmental and energy security uh, by promoting affordable domestic transportation fuels and technologies. So since mobile sources contribute to about two thirds of the air pollutants causing ozone formation in the region, our main focus is improving air quality within the transportation sector. So as you can see here, ozone, on att ozone attainment is a bit of a moving target um, the great thing about EVs is they produce no emissions, and uh, so higher EV adoption can decrease the ozone levels and help us attain that moving target. <laughs> so as many of you have um, probably seen, there is a steady increase in the amount of EVs being manufactured, and we are seeing some of the major OEMs are sitting, setting goals to transition a large percentage of EVs and become carbon neutral in the very near future. So we've also seen a steady increase in electric vehicle adoption in North Texas, as these numbers increase and increased demand for electric vehicle charging infrastructure will also become apparent. So we do keep track of vehicle registration in Texas um, as well. Um, and you can find all of this information at dfwcleancities.org slash EVNT. So now that we've talked a little bit about the steady increase in EVs throughout the region, um, which is the main reason why EV charging is so important, I wanted to explain the types of EV chargers and their pros and cons. So as you can see in this table, there are three types of chargers, um, level one, level two, and DC fast charge. So based on the levels of charging, applications may be different. So for example, since level one charger is relatively slow to its counterparts, these chargers are most commonly used at home. Uh, this includes both single family garages and driveways, as well as multifamily dwellings like apartment complexes or duplexes. Generally at an average workplace, cars are sitting for eight hours, therefore uh, level one or level two charging can be applicable. Uh, public chargers are generally level two or DC fast chargers to allow for speedy charging in parking lots, municipalities, hotels, and leisure destinations. As you want to add a station, it's important to think about the, what type of charger you want based on the location and potential customers. 
So due to the installation costs, generally public chargers are significantly more expensive, which is why we've asked the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Federal Highway Administration to discuss some state and federal uh, funding opportunities for these types of chargers. So on this slide, I just wanted to mention some off-grid charging technologies. So there's storage, which utilizes onboard batteries that store electricity to allow for faster charging and charging off-grid. Mobile chargers, which allows for portable and emergency charging of EVs without any additional infrastructure. So um, I, I know you guys have heard of AAA. <laughs> there are companies out there that will come and charge your EV in an emergency situation if you're stranded on a, on a road for some reason. Um, and then we also have solar, which enables off-grid charging for greater resiliency. So another way we classify chargers is being networked or non-networked. Uh, network chargers tend to be a little more expensive since they come with an additional subscription cost, but add features such as summary reports, network dashboards, uh, smart demand response, payment options, reservations, and messaging. These features can be helpful for EV drivers who are on the go and wanting to know if the stalls are full or not. Um, some networks will add that information to their applications and non-networked chargers or standalone chargers have no network access and simply enables an EV driver to get safe charging. So we keep a close watch on EV registration, EV charging stations, and where vehicles are registered in comparison to where the infrastructure is. Currently, there's a strong correlation between the locations of chargers and the homes of EVs. Um, as you can see in this map, EV drivers in areas with high adoption or the dark red areas um, tend to um, want to um, travel along those interstates to connect them to neighboring metropolitan areas and states. With DC fast charging, this makes road trips possible for EV drivers. And since 2016, the Federal Highway Administration has set up alternative fuel corridors that signify the highway can be safely and reliably used by alternative fuels. As you can see in this graphic, our region is almost completely ready for EV charging, except for I-20 headed east and west of the Metroplexes. So what are we doing about it? <laughs> well, this is just one example of the ways we get involved into helping build out infrastructure. As part of the Volkswagen settlement, Electrify America plans to invest $2 billion in zero emission vehicle infrastructure and education outreach. We submitted comments and suggested several site locations based on gap analysis for the three cycles of public comments. In June, Electrify America released the Cycle 3 National Investment Plan, which included six stations along I-20 from Dallas to Birmingham and plans to invest eight to 12 stations in the DFW area. You can read our comments and the Electrify America plan on our website at nctcog.org slash trans slash air slash VW settlement. So now here are some of the benefits of, of EV charging and what that can bring to your properties. So a huge benefit of installing EV charging stations is boosting economic activity in your community as EV owners may dine, shop, or explore your town as they wait for their vehicle to charge. EV charging can also contribute points to building certifications like LEED, which may reduce your insurance rates. And the value, eval, availability of EV chargers also shows public commitment to the environment and air quality. So we'll hear more about um, how EV charging can boost economic activity for your community from the next presenter, Buzz Smith. So Buzz, if you're ready to go, I can scroll for you. I'm absolutely ready. All right, your town is in competition with every other town along the interstate. Opportunity is knocking in the form of electric vehicle drivers. 
As Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. EV charging infrastructure may seem like that, but our mission today is to make it a little less magical so you can see its value for your town. Go ahead. Now, all new technologies have adoption curves. In the beginning, they're adopted very slowly, then suddenly they'll take off. Now, looking at these curves can be misleading if they're misinterpreted. Modern electric vehicles are already 13 years old, and the autom automotive industry is now moving into that green zone where adoption really takes off. And that's where opportunity is at its greatest. Now, how soon can it happen? This is a great illustration. Um, it's Fifth Avenue in New York City, 10 years apart. So on Easter morning in 1900, there's a traffic jam of horses and buggies with one automobile in the entire picture, and that's the where the red circle is. 10 years later, Easter morning, 1913, not a single horse and buggy. It's all automobiles at that point. So it can happen very quickly, even in something as expensive as the automotive sector. Seriously, things can change that quickly? Well, if you doubt the speed of change occurs in today's markets, just remember the lesson from 2007 and the first iPhone. Before the iPhone debut, debuted in 2007, cell phones had all sorts of form factors trying to grab your attention with styling rather than with functionality. Back in those days, the phones were given away for free uh, just to get you to sign the mobile service contract. The iPhone was ridiculed by its competitor but competitors because they felt no one would pay $595 instead of taking any other phone for free. But within just three years, all those other phone companies started producing phones that looked pretty much like the iPhone or they faded away. Even the flagship phone for businesses, the BlackBerry fell into disuse and industry leaders like Motorola and Nokia lost their top market positions. Now this slide shows the adoption curves of several electric vehicles and notice that they all increase at about the same rate, but there's this one black line that suddenly takes off. And that is not an EV. That was the original Toyota Prius hybrid. And it's considered the gold standard for new automotive technology adoption. Right around its 40th month in production, you can see suddenly that curve went up and the adoption curve took off like that because gasoline prices suddenly shot up. Adoption was accelerated by outside market forces. Now, Tesla 3's, um, or Tesla's Model 3 adoption changed everything by having 400,000 units reserved for production or before production started. You can see from its adoption curve, it was much steeper than the original Prius. The Model 3's adoption will be blown away by Tesla's Cybertruck because it already has 1.25 million reservations and they haven't even finished the factory yet. By the way, that factory is located in Austin, Texas. So Texas should be a place where we'll see lots of Cybertrucks soon. Ford already has 120,000 reservations for the F-150 Lightning and it won't go into production until 2022. Due to this, Ford recently announced they are already doubling the production capacity of the factory from 40,000 trucks per year to 80,000. Rivian, a new player in the EV world, already has 30,000 reservations for its R1T pickup and its R1S SUV, which went into production earlier this month, the pickup did, September 2021. And demand has been so strong for, that Rivian is currently looking for a location for its next factory, and Fort Worth, Texas is on the short list. So Texas will probably be leading the nation in electric pickup trucks in the near future. Now, why am I so focused on electric pickup trucks? Well, it's because in the United States, 46 states have more truck sales than car sales. 60% of the sales at the dealership I used to work for consisted of trucks. Some of these models are starting production in late 2021, and the others will debut between now and 2022 or 2023. And notice these electric trucks are being marketed as work trucks and adventure vehicles. 
The Bollinger Motors truck in the upper left is shown driving through axle deep snow. The Cyber truck in the lower left has an ATV in the truck, truck bed that's about to head out for an adventure. And the Rivian R1T in the lower right has a tent platform positioned above the truck bed and even a pull out electric cooktop that tucks away between the bed and the cab. The tipping point for electric vehicle adoption is happening right now and pickups will drive the way. Now, is Texas ready? Well, as you can see from this map, we're already well on our way. Texas had chargers in place to support many routes, but more will be needed as two trends develop. One, using EVs to go on those long road trips and vacations, and two, EV adoption by people who cannot charge at home. Installing infra uh, charging infrastructure in smaller cities and towns will be key to the success of the road trip trend. Next slide. Ah, here's a great example of a gap in Texas current art, uh, charging infrastructure. And Bethany mentioned this earlier. Between the outskirts of Dallas and the destination of Shreveport, Louisiana, the only DC fast chargers are located in Lindale near Tyler, but are only for Tesla vehicles within walking distance or two restaurants. Now, why is this important? Well, in the 19th century, railroads brought economic prosperity to towns growing some into major cities. In fact, Houston, Texas has a locomotive as the central image on the city seal. In the 20th century, the interstate highways brought prosperity. In fact, when the federal government decided it was time to update Route 66, the towns along its original route fought to keep the highway passing through their towns because it had brought so much economic prosperity. In the 21st century, it will be electric vehicle charging infrastructure that will attract people to your city instead of some other city. The reason for this is that EV drivers plan their trips around charger locations. Before they even leave home, they've selected where they're going to stop to charge. The most important three things in both real estate and charging infrastructure are location, location, and location. DC fast chargers are really fast. An electric vehicle can charge from empty to full in 30 minutes to two and a half hours, depending on the vehicle. This is not like a gas station where people pull into your town, stop for five minutes, and then head on down the road. Drivers need something to occupy their time during that stop time. The perfect location for a DC fast charger is within walking distance of places that drivers would want or need to visit for that period of time, like restaurants, your shopping district, movie theaters, local attractions, city parks, things like that. It's a perfect opportunity for several businesses or a chamber of commerce to join together to share the cost and the benefits provided by those chargers. Level two or 220 volt chargers are slower, requiring overnight charging, and it's appropriate for places people will stay overnight, like hotels, B&Bs, and rest stops. You may not have thought of this as charging, but even a simple 240 volt 50 amp outlet, like you see at campgrounds today, may be used for charging an EV if the driver brings along a portable, two le or portable level two charger, which many drivers do when they travel. Campgrounds and rest areas are great places to install these outlets. The great news is that even these outlets can be listed on charging apps used by EV drivers to route their trip and select your town as a recharge stop. Less than four and a half miles away from those Tesla chargers I mentioned near Tyler is a prime location for DC fast chargers. There are 18 restaurants within easy walking distance. There are three hotels that can host less expensive level two overnight charging to attract lodgers and a Walmart for road trip or camping supplies. In Tyler, there are multiple attractions travelers could visit while their cars charge if shuttles or ride shared services were made available. All these businesses could join forces to fund this project and share the benefit. Now, as Bethany mentioned earlier, DC fast chargers don't necessarily have to have 480 volt three phase service from the grid. The charger on the left uses an onboard battery to store energy from just a 240 volt supply reducing the grid requirements and the cost to install the charger. And it's able to recharge EVs at the DC fast charger speed of up to 150 kilowatts. 
The dual level two charger shown to the lower right is a much less expensive solution and it's appropriate for hotels where somebody has all night to charge, as I mentioned earlier. The chargers in the upper right are cool because they have video displays, so you can have video showing the local restaurants, businesses, and attractions that you want to make sure EV drivers know about in your town. I'll bet you could even get those casinos in Shreveport to chip in if you let them advertise their shows and jackpots. In Kerrville, Texas, a couple of DC fast chargers are located in the parking lot of their visitor center. Inside that center is an entire wall of brochures about things to do and see in the Kerrville area. Within easy walking distance are five restaurants, a Starbucks, and seven hotels. There is another DC fast charger in Kerrville located at the James Avery Jewelry Headquarters and Visitor Center. While your EV is charging, you can tour the center to see how jewelry is made and do a little shopping. We were camping in Enchanted Rock about 40 miles from Kerrville, and we visited the Chargers twice during that trip. We used that time to have Mexican food, award-winning barbecue, and to bicycle and kayak at the beautiful Kerrville Park that was just 2.7 miles from the Chargers. We probably would have never discovered this wonderful little town had it not been for the Chargers being there. Now, we're sure to stop by Kerrville whenever we're in the area. Filling an EV is not like filling up with gasoline. EV drivers need things to do while they charge. Your local businesses want those drivers from the interstate to stop by and to dine, shop, and otherwise spend time and money in your town. What they'll discover as they venture out in their EV is that, as in life, it is the journey, not just the destination, that makes traveling fun. That's what my family discovered when we've taken an EV out on the road, and it has forever changed the way we look at long distance trip. Your town is special. Make sure you provide a reason for people to stop and discover that. As the voice said in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Buzz, do you want me to play the, the video here? No, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your uh, oh sorry your presentation that was great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think next we have oh here it goes. I just need to click a few times. Yeah, this is us heading out for an adventure. We're strapping a kayak on the roof. We're going to strap two bicycles on the back of it. Um, we folded down the back seats, giving us about 60 cubic feet of storage, and we had that jam packed with all sorts of camping equipment. And we headed into, like I said, Enchanted Rock. That area of Texas has very few chargers, but we never had range anxiety. We never worried about getting to the charger. We knew we were going to make it. We knew where they were. And we had a wonderful vacation and discovered some really cool little towns in Texas. Yeah, this is playing really jerky on mine. You may not want to go all the way through it. <laughs> No worries. It's great to see you using your electric vehicle to go on camping trips and everything. I, as someone that goes on camping trips a lot, I, I love that. And I love the new, the new uh, trucks as well. They'll be great for anyone who's interested in the outdoors. Um, all right. Um, does anyone have any questions before we move on to the next presenter? Okay, great. Well, the next person we have to present today is Nate Hickman from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and he'll be um, sharing his screen with um, and showing the, the Texas um, Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Program um, and walking us through that. So, Nate, are you there? I'm here, Bethany. Can awesome. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Um, go ahead and I'll sh stop share and you can share. Thank you. And Buzz, it was uh, great to see that y'all pack about as much as I do when I head to Enchanted Rock. Um, e Rock is a great destination, and it's it's wonderful that we have chargers in the area that can help our electric folk go there. So, um, as Bethany mentioned, I'm with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Um, I've got, got the great fortune of helping to design and implement some of our um, Texas emission reduction plan programs, as well as our Texas Volkswagen uh, uh, Environmental Mitigation Trust program. So. 
uh, through the TERP, the Texas Emission Reduction Plan. Um, historically, we've gotten about $154 million to put toward uh, replacing older heavy duty, some light duty, and some stationary equipment in key areas of Texas with high ozone pollution. Um, with the Texas Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust Funds, we got about $209 million uh, to put toward various programs to do very similar work, but also uh, to help fund um, electric charging infrastructure and electric vehicles. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. And for my presentation, I'd just like to take you all to our websites so that you're very familiar with where to go, what to click on, and kind of how to find the opportunities that may be out there for you for funding for electric vehicles or charging infrastructure, as well as um, any other vehicle projects to, to help reduce pollution in Texas that you or folks that you know may be interested in. So with that, I will take the, uh, the great leap and risk of trying to share my screen. We'll see if that works. And I will rely on Bethany to tell me if um, we can all see our Texas Emission Reduction Plan page here for first. Yes, we can see it. Fantastic. I'm sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can see. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so what you see here, and I'm, I'm going to start with the Texas Emission Reduction Plan, and that's because this is a program that's been funded since 2001. Uh, it's created by the state legislature, and we have a variety of programs. I think we're up to 11 programs now uh, with funding to help um, replace older diesel and other heavy-duty equipment, off-road equipment like tractors and dozers, but we also have programs to uh, offer rebates for light-duty electric vehicles. Very importantly, we have an alternative fueling facilities program, AFFP, and we've been able to implement this for several years now. Um, and this program offers funding up to four hundred dollars or $600,000, depending on the project type for alternative fueling infrastructure. Historically, we've seen a lot of propane or natural gas. More recently, we're seeing a whole lot of electric interest in this particular program. We expect to open this one up again in this next two year cycle. We don't have a, a, a finite date, but we're working on developing the program now uh, to make it even, even easier and, and more fun for folks to apply. And this is for a specific zone in Texas that we call the clean transportation zone. And so if you think, if you know Texas, you think of I-45 from Houston up to Dallas, I-35 down to Austin, San Antonio and, and beyond, I-10 that kind of bridges them, but also down to South Texas and over to Corpus Christi. We have this entire zone of major thoroughfares in the state that we're able to help fund um, new alternative fueling infrastructure along but also in between. Um, so that actually is a, a good reason to, let's see if I can minimize this. Okay, so that's a great reason to visit our webpage here. This is what you'll find. And we're continually trying to update and, and make it even uh, better and easier for people to explore. Uh, but we have a great video here. It's also on YouTube about our programs and, and what, they're, what they're about basically. But very importantly, down here, more information, you can sign up for email updates. This is great, we don't spam. Um, this basically gets you an automated email every time that we're about to open a, uh, a new program or when, whenever we're going to have a, a webinar or, or workshop to, to teach folks about our programs or a specific program that's opening. So we have hundreds, maybe thousands of people signed up for these, and they're always the first to know when we're about to open a program. So I very much encourage you to jump in there. Um, also, once you get in there, you can choose to sign up for other uh, neat TCEQ alerts and programs as well. If you've never been there before, I know a lot of you have. Um, so this is the webpage that you'll find. You can click on our grant programs here. And uh, this is where we get to test my internet speed. And you can see the various programs that we offer. We just started our new uh, fiscal cycle. So we have not opened a program uh, just yet, but we're about to, it's very exciting. Um, we, we will probably open our light duty motor vehicle program first. So this is the rebates for electric and other alternative fuel vehicles that um, you I might my drive to work or to Enchanted Rock. Um, so that's a great rebate opportunity here. And I encourage you all to, to look into that and tell the people that you know um, that that will be coming soon. We'll be announcing that very soon. So kind of switching gears, looking at the Volkswagen, um, Texas Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Program, like I said, we've been given funds to implement programs that are very similar to what we do with the Texas Mission Reduction Plan. Um, but this was a part of a VW settlement uh, that that was result that resulted from a, an agreement with Volkswagen after some emissions issues that they had uh, with various states, and we did get two hundred nine million dollars. So um, we've been able to open several grant programs again, much like the TERP programs, 
um, to help reduce emissions from buses and refuse vehicles, uh, freight and port drayage. But more uh, recently, we've been working on our light, or sorry, our level two and fast charge uh, electric um, charging infrastructure. So we opened up our level two charging infrastructure, and Buzz talked a little bit about this too uh, a while back. And I'm very excited. We closed on September 7th, and uh, we've just received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications there throughout that program, and especially at the end, as we usually do. So um, even this morning, I'm signing contracts, and I'm, I'm feeling confident that. Um, pretty much any hotel that I stay at in across the state of Texas, and this is statewide, will probably have one or two level two chargers at them. So we've seen lots of interest there from hotels to restaurants to some gas stations and other places um, for the level two charging. Again, where folks might want to plug in for a little bit longer, hang out, walk around town, that sort of thing. Um, very, very neat uh, places that those are popping up, even state parks and other places. So um, look out for your level two chargers to expand in their network and their various sites. Um, of course, we'll post where these are um, on our website as soon as we have that updated, so you can always check with us. And of course, um, there are sites the U.S. Department of Energy shows as well where um, various chargers are located. So the big news is, and a lot of you have heard of this, anticipated it, it's been a long time coming, our next grant round that we're going to open under the Texas uh, Volkswagen Environment, Environmental Mitigation Program, so that's a mouthful, sorry, um, is for the DC fast chargers. And so this is like we've been talking about, this is where you can go and you can, you know, if you've, you've got your electric vehicle, truck, what have you, you've got 45% charge, you can stop plug in for a few minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or more and get uh, the rest of that full charge and keep going very quickly. Um, you can imagine these at places like your typical gas station where you might go or, or other places where you want to go in and buy peanuts or sodas or what have you. Um, so we're going to open this program uh, very soon, and we'll be making an announcement uh, via our government delivery service through that email that I showed you all earlier with the TURP program. Um, when this opens, we will also um, be hosting another webinar. We've already hosted one uh, discussing the program requirements and what's available under this program. This one is particularly exciting because folks have been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, similar programs have opened up across the country, and this one will offer substantial funding toward the build out of our DC fast charge system in the state of Texas. So we're all very excited about that. Don't wanna to run too far over my time. Uh, we've got many, many programs under TERP and TexVimp. I'll just shorten it here. And uh, I'd like to um, open up to any questions, I guess now or after the presentations, whatever the, uh, the program decides. But um, thank y'all very much for inviting us here and taking a look at our programs. Thank you, Nate. Appreciate it. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nate? I know there was a message in the chat box for Nate's contact informa information. Nate, if you don't mind uh, putting that in there, if you feel comfortable, or putting in the Volkswagen information on how. No, I'm sorry. I, I I can't be contacted, but um, I can. No, I'm just kidding. I I can definitely put contact information in there for myself and our program emails. Um, staff that I work with are excellent in responding even quicker than I can. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Any other questions for Nate? Okay, let me share my screen again and we'll get started with the next presenter. All right, so next we've got um, Stephen Costa and Rob Hyman with the U.S. Department of Transportation. They'll be giving some information on their Alto Corridors program, uh, funding opportunities in the Roots Initiative. All right. Are you all ready? I think so. Great. I'm trying to get my camera to brighten up a little, but oh well, you don't even need to see me. Uh, but anyways, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, happy to, to share, to fill in for Diane Turchetta, uh, who wasn't able to make it today. Uh, my name is Stephen Costa. I'm a technical analyst uh, in the Energy Analysis and Sustainability Division uh, at the Volpe National Transportation System Center. And I provide support to uh, various modal offices within the department on uh, energy and alternative fuel topics, uh, including FHWA's Alternative Fuels Quarter Program. So. Um, uh, I'm happy to give some background uh, briefly on the AFC program and provide an update um, on some of the proposed EV infrastructure funding uh, through the potentially uh, imminent bipartisan infrastructure bill, we'll see, 
And, uh, and then I'll pass the slides on to my colleague, Rob Hyman, and DOT's Office of the Secretary to discuss the rural opportunities to use transportation for economic success program. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, uh, I, I know uh, Lori uh, or Bethany had already begun to, uh, to kind of go over some of the aspects of the corridor uh, designations, at least within uh, the, the, uh, the Dallas area. Um, but I'll just give a quick overview. Uh, so since, for, for those that don't know, since 2016, uh, DOT's Federal Highway Administration has worked with state and local officials to designate national electric vehicle charging, uh, along with hydrogen, propane, and natural gas uh, fueling corridors along major highways, as required by the 2015 FAST Act. Um, to explain this map a little bit, uh, what the green lines mean, those represent uh, ready corridors that uh, meet the criteria that have been set for uh, a particular fuel type. And, uh, and, and those green corridors uh, are permitted for the installation of, FH of uh, FHWA approved uh, alternative fuel highway signage for that fuel. Uh, the dashed or orange lines represent pending corridors and uh, those corridors are where there's some uh, charging or fueling infrastructure uh, installed and, and a demonstrated interest. Uh, in expanding that infrastructure, but um, there's still gaps and not quite enough there. Uh, you know, these gaps need to be filled in order for highway signage to be installed and for the traveling public, um, you know, to feel confident that they can travel those corridors and not run out of fuel or run out of charge. Uh, I would note that this, uh, this is the only map we have uh, in, in these slides. Uh, it's a little deceptive because this is, uh, you know, this is actually uh, reflecting all fuels. So these are all corridors that have been designated across the country for one or more fuels. And a lot of the green ready quarter segments that you see there showing in Texas uh, on this map are, are actually mostly attributable to propane and natural gas infrastructure. Um, uh, currently EV ready corridor uh, coverage is less, uh, you know, than both of these fuels in Texas. Um, however, the one thing I'll note is that between the good work of NCTCOG, uh, Texas DOT, and the Houston Galveston Area Council um, over the past five years since the program started, uh, EV quarters have been designated along uh, segments of 16 interstates, one US uh, highway and one state highway in Texas. Okay, next slide. Uh, this, uh, this chart just shows how the designations have grown. Uh, again, this is reflective of all fuels, not just charging, uh, even though there's a charger there. Um, so uh, to date, since, uh, since 2016, uh, the program has uh, designated uh, portions or segments of 134 interstates across the country, along with 125 U.S. highways and state roads, um, 49 states in total, so almost 50, uh, plus D.C., and uh, 166,000 miles of the national highway system uh, across all fuels have been designated, uh, either pending or, or, or ready. Um, you know, for, for EV in particular, um, the, spe the specific mileage is uh, 59,000 miles or 27% of the national highway system. But, um, you know, to caveat that only 23,000 of those miles are, are truly ready. So um, still a lot, a lot left, a lot of work left to do. Um, uh, just I just note as far as the EV criteria goes, for those that aren't familiar, EV uh, ready corridor needs to have uh, public DC fast charging uh, sites every 50 miles. And uh, the stations need to be no further than five miles from the corridor. Um, and uh, you know, Buzz was talking about Tesla sites, which you know they've ruled out quite aggressively in the past few years. Uh, the program hasn't been counting Tesla sites in uh, for the designations uh, simply because Tesla hasn't opened up their stations to any other vehicles besides Teslas. Um, that may change. We've heard you know at least one uh, mysterious tweet from Elon Musk and suggests that it might change, but. Um, you know, we'll see how that turns out. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, okay, so on Earth Day this year, uh, DOT Secretary uh, Buttigieg and White House Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy announced a slew of federal actions to support the advancement of EVs and EV infrastructure uh, across the country. Um, the Secretary announced the 2021 Round 5 uh, Alternative Fuel Quarter designations. And then he also announced this brief report that DOT put together summarizing a range of existing programs um, at DOT, funding, funding and financing, financing programs that have um, you know, some degree of eligibility for, 
uh, to fund EVs, EV infrastructure, and or EV workforce development. And then if you go to the next slide, that will show um, what that looks like. So, and there's the link, so you can go through the slides and check that out. So this is, you know, this was sort of, you know, the first few months of the administration, they wanted to, you know, kind of do a, a check across, um, you know, DOT and see, you know, what's already, out, what, what dollars are already out there that could, you know, potentially fund infrastructure. Um, but uh, going to the next slide, I'll just give a very quick recap of what's happening with the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, which may be voted on today, we're not sure. Um, it changes from minute to minute. Uh, but as far as what's proposed in there, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a, a lot's in there. Um, as, as proposed, uh, currently, uh, the bill would provide significant uh, funding to states for the installation of DC fast uh, EV charging infrastructure along corridors. So that would be um, totaling $5 billion over five years uh, in, in formula funding to states. Uh, it would also provide competitive funding uh, for EV as well as uh, fueling infrastructure for all the other fuels, natural gas, hydrogen, and propane, uh, both along corridors and, and within communities, um, so off, off corridors. And that, that funding has been uh, marked as two, uh, two and a half billion uh, over five years. And then uh, it also does, uh, directs DOT to designate EV, uh, national EV freight corridors, uh, in addition to ongoing alternative fuel corridor designations. And uh, it also stands up a joint, a new joint office between DOE and DOT to plan, uh, study, plan, and coordinate uh, on various technical topics and issues uh, uh, with electrifying the transportation sector. Uh, across the country. Um, and then the next slide uh, just gives a link uh, where it gives a little bit more information. There's a fact sheet uh, that you can check out. The fact sheet was linked, I think, on the previous slide. And then if this, this particular link uh, highlights how the funds, uh, the formula, how the five billion in formula funding would be uh, distributed among all the states. So, you know, under, under the bill, uh, Texas, would receive, would expect, or at least is estimated the way, uh, you know, it was presented at, you know, when this was put together, uh, 408 million over five years to support uh, charging infrastructure along, along, along uh, highway corridors. Um, this would be in addition to being able to, uh, you know, compete for the two and a half billion in uh, community and, and other corridor grant funding. Uh, just to give a perspective, you know, as far as the neighbor, neighboring states go, Oklahoma, uh, would receive 66 million, uh, Louisiana 73 million, Arkansas 54 million. So Texas would definitely be getting uh, potentially a, a good amount of funding. Um, so there's still a lot of questions, uh, you know, depending on how the bill passes. But um, you know, we're, we're just waiting to see what happens. Uh, you know, should it pass, to be guidance developed, um, we probably have a round six, uh, an additional round of alternative fuel quarter designations. Um, but uh, I guess stay tuned and uh, you know, we'll be happy to, to share information as soon as it becomes available. Um, and then the next slide is just some program contacts and uh, some useful websites that you'd wanna check out. And with that, I'll pass it on to Rob. Hey, uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I am a, I'm Rob Hyman. I'm also the Department of Transportation. Um, and I'm in the, uh, I lead the Rural Opportunities to Use Transportation for Economic Success Initiative, which is a very long name, uh, which we abbreviate routes or routes, depending on um, where you come from. And just to give you a brief background on routes before I dive into what we're doing about on uh, EVs, um, the initiative is uh, meant to really deal with um, essentially the disparities we see in, in uh, folks' ability to access DOT funds and DOT programs. Um, and so we do a bunch of different things. A lot of it is engaging through st with stakeholders um, to get uh, better information on what they would like us to be working on, what their priorities are. Uh, we do a fair amount of data collection and trend analyzing. But really, the biggest thing we do is providing user-friendly information and technical assistance back to rural stakeholders um, to help them kind of navigate the DOT uh, grant system and understand um, how to apply for money from DOT. We have a series of resources up on our website. Um, we have this grant applicant toolkit that uh, walks you through the various discretionary grant programs at DOT, uh, various web pages that, uh, that will tell you about um, uh, current funding and financing opportunities at the department. Um, we do webinars and trainings as well. 
Um, so that's sort of a, what we do uh, uh, writ large on rural. If we go to the next slide. Um, and earlier this year, we started thinking about what should we be doing about electric vehicles. And obviously, if you think about rural areas, they lag uh, both in the number of vehicles and also in EV infrastructure. And so our thought was, you know, uh, people thinking about EV infrastructure in rural areas are probably lacking a lot of the information they really need to move forward. So we wanted to provide um, a, a guidebook that would essentially provide this user inf user friendly information on how you plan, fund, and implement EV charger networks. Um, so this toolkit that we're putting out is uh, will have a number of features. It's going to highlight the benefits of EVs for rural areas, um, the kind of stuff that was covered so well uh, earlier in today's uh, panel. Um, will help uh, uh, project sponsors understand the different uh, funding and financing programs they can access, and not just at the Department of Transportation, but also the Department of Energy, um, and particularly USDA, which has a lot of really great uh, rural-focused funding programs. Um, and then we'll provide some technical advice on planning and implementing charging. So the idea being that, you know, if you don't know that much about it, but are interested in uh, putting in chargers in your town or community, or area, um, this is the guide that will kind of walk you through what you need to know and point you to the right sources for more information. Um, and so the next slide shows uh, a little bit of the kind of information we'll be putting in there. Um, this is our draft table of contents. Um, our schedule is that we are planning to get the initial toolkit out in the fall. Um, that's looking like probably late November or early December. Um, and then over the winter, we want to conduct a series of workshops with users of the toolkit, um, stakeholders, to understand um, what works and what doesn't in the toolkit, um, identify gaps and more information that we need to put in, and then we'll roll out a revised toolkit in the spring. Uh, part of the idea behind the schedule is also because we know the landscape is changing pretty fast in terms of funding programs. Stephen was talking about some of the big programs that will come through if this bill passes. Um, and while we want to get information out as soon as we can on everything you can do right now, we also want to be able to update it pretty quickly with information on these new programs um, as they start to come online. Um, so uh, that is um, about it. If you uh, uh, want any more information on any of this, uh, our website is right there. You can email us as well. Um, we do, by the way, if you're interested in rural information in general, uh, have a newsletter uh, which we put out quarterly and so you can uh, feel free to subscribe to that. Um, if folks are interested in participating in this workshopping that we plan to do over the winter, please do contact us. We are very interested in uh, finding uh, uh, sort of willing partners uh, to help us with this toolkit and getting the information in it right. Uh, that's about what I have. Hey, thank you, Rob. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, does anyone have any questions for Stephen or Rob? Not seeing anything in the chat. But feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Okay, well, um, Soraya Adibi is going to give us um, some information on re resources for electric vehicle charging. Um, she's with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and um, so I'll let her take it away. Oh, and maybe Lori is going to present. <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping in just on this one slide. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Lori Clark. Um, I'm a manager in our air quality team and the Dallas Fort Worth Clean Cities coordinator. If you don't know me, I think many of you know me, but um, since we're talking about electric vehicles, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a detour just for a second. Uh, you know, individually, an electric vehicle is not going to add much in terms of overall electricity bill, utility consumption. But if you build out a charging station, um, and do it well, and it's very successful, cumulatively, there may be a little bit um, of an electric bill to, to look at um, for your property. And so we wanted to highlight just a couple things that are available in terms of resources to help reduce electricity consumption through energy efficiency and other types of projects like that to, to you know, mitigate any sort of impacts. So if you are with a local government, um, the State Energy Conservation Office offers a lot um, at no cost for you. So they have an engineering firm that um, is under contract with them to provide preliminary energy assessments at no cost to the local government. 
Um, there's a technical assistance request that you send into SECO. Um, and then, you know, they'll make arrangements for that engineering firm to come out and they'll identify those projects that would provide the best return on investment, the most low hanging fruit, um, estimated cost savings that could come from that. And then if it's a project that um, you really need financial assistance with, uh, SECO also offers uh, low interest loans um, for local governments, as long as it's on public sector property. So I can chat a link to, uh, to those programs or realize you can't click on what you're seeing right now, but um, I can chat a link to that free technical assistance from SECO. Really encourage anybody with the local government um, or public agency of any sort to, to look into that. If you're with a, a private entity um, or you want to support private entities within your city or your county, uh, there's a program called PACE. Um, it's a financing program that will finance um, energy efficiency and water conservation projects at commercial or industrial properties in the state of Texas. PACE is available in other parts of the country for residential. It is not available for residential projects in Texas, only commercial and industrial properties. Um, Multifamily housing, I believe five or more dwelling units are considered commercial for the purpose of the program. Um, PACE has to be set up through either a county or a city to be available for the properties within um, that boundary. So um, it is a little spotty in our region right now. Um, there's some expansion to that coming very soon, but if you're interested in any of that, um, I'll chat a, an email address for the team that we have that works on energy uh, projects. And it's just energy at nctcog.org um, so you can get more details. With that, I think now I'm turning it over to Soraya. Yeah, thank you, Lori. And just as a reminder for everyone, um, Bethany did send out the slides yesterday in a PDF, so you should be able to click on uh, those links and get access through um, that document. And so um, if you don't mind, next slide, uh, just in anticipation of any questions and kind of tie together a lot of the great information and content that our presenters provided, uh, we wanted to quickly highlight some of these resources um, relating to um, getting started with um, electric vehicles and understanding the whole ecosystem of how to um, install a station. Uh, the first one being the Alt Fuels, Alternative Fuels Data Center. That's a great resource um, provided through the DOE. Um, there's also an electric vehicle charger station um, guide that they offer. Um, you might have also seen some of the maps and, and screenshots of the stations which we were able to provide through the um, Alt Fuel Dating Center website. Um, we also, like Bethany mentioned, track the EV registration data in our region, as well as for the state. And that's also available on our website, uh, dfdwcleancities.org forward slash EVNT. Um, and as mentioned, all of these great funding opportunities as they're coming out from the state, local, and uh, federal level will be posted on our NCT COG AQ funding page, which, um, Bethany had also mentioned in a, a previous slide. And um, lastly, as the DFW Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities, we have our own resources specific to the region, as well as hosting events such as the one webinar today where we um, are able to engage stakeholders in our region and um, provide information that's being requested to us and, and from us and that's seen as in, of interest. So. Just so you know, these are all um, available and everyone who's in attendance today um, will re also receive the slides again after the um, presentation. So next slide, please. And so as mentioned, this is the Alt Fuel Station locator where you can find charging stations and map your, your route. Like Buzz mentioned, he was able to anticipate where he, would he was going to charge on his trip so that he wasn't um, having to, you know, worry about where he would charge. And so this is one tool that's also through, provided from the Alt Fuel Data Center and DOE. Um, this is also something that we, as the Council of Government, um, submit stations through the um, Alt Fuels Data Center um, so that we can keep that up to date and make sure that all those stations in our region are accounted for um, th through this tool. So next slide, please. And so if we kind of convinced you into, well, maybe I, I do wanna uh, add some electric vehicle charging station to my property. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, tie together some specific steps on what, how, how to get that, um, the ball rolling to, to install an electric vehicle station. Uh, first thing um, that we might've touched on a little bit, 
during the presentations, but it's really the, the first step is you want to engage your electric utility, especially if you're wanting to install a DC fast charging station where we're talking about 150 plus kilowatt. Um, so that is something that we recommend at the forefront, engage in your utility, let them know what plans um, that you have for a charging station so that they can make sure to provide adequate electricity. Again, this is something in particular as if you're having a networked um, charging station, this is particularly important. If you have a non-network station, uh, which was shown in the, the, um, in the slide on the different charging options, that's something that there is uh, maybe some less hurdles to, um, or less uh, logistics to figure out that way. So we, all, we do um, try to help our communities find their contact to the best utility service area or the best EV electric vehicle specific contact for your utility service area, as well as, you know, um, we are keeping track of utility incentives as they're coming available. We don't see as much of those yet in the state of Texas, but we do in other states and anticipate um, more incentive programs being available. So we encourage you to reach out to us at uh, cleancities, um, cleancities at nctcog.org. Um, as in the next step, again, you know, you want to really upfront be able to determine how much is this going to cost and understand um, each of those factors, including not just the equipment and installation of, but construction, trenching, electrical capacity, um, permitting. And this is something, since we have many communities on, on the um, line, is maybe, it, it, you know, if we have any planning uh, officials, maybe look at to what what are your permitting requirements for EVSC installations? Um, because generally there is a building requirement, electric requi uh, per permit requirement or both. Um, and this very much varies by municipality. Um, and this is something that, you know, you may consider streamlining um, into making this a more easier process for um, locations like the hotels and restaurants who may be interested in, in uh, installing infrastructure and also considering things like operation costs. So this would come into play if you have a networked um, charging station versus a non-network station, but things like equipment maintenance and um, are something that you're going to have to um, consider in the long term as well. So it's great to do that before you start um, putting the equipment in the ground. And so finally, once you have the station there, you want to make sure that people know about it and that you can see it and use it. Um, and so we do encourage people to make sure to include things like signage um, and other different ways to kind of differentiate that this is a specific EV parking. It can be as simple as just using getting some paint and um, painting the parking spot. Um, you also just want to keep into consideration things like safety and making sure there's adequate lighting and that people um, are able to um, access it safely and look into the ADA um, compliance for full accessibility. Uh, again, um, you wanna make sure people can find your station on the great resources that we mentioned. And so you, these can be added to the AFDC station locator that I just mentioned. Um, but you can also just email us at cleancities.nctcog.org and we will add that information in there so EV owners are aware of your station. So uh, next slide, please. And so lastly today, I wanted to let y'all know um, that we are having our National Drive Electric Week this year um, as an outdoor in-person event. This is being held this Sunday at the Wreck of Grapevine. Um, we hope that you will be able to join us. Um, this is something that we have in past years held, um, I think for, for the past 10 years in, in the agency. And so, um, we will be having an EV expo. Currently, we have over uh, 400 attendees registered, 446 as of this moment or this morning, and 162 vehicles that will be coming out and displayed so that um, attendees can come see and um, get to experience electric vehicles, talk, mix and mingle with owners as well as dealers. Um, we will have a food truck on site this year. Thank you to Encore and the North Texas Tesla's owner group. Uh, we will also be able to provide a ride and drive or try and drive um, opportunities through iDrive Place uh, Motor One um, dealership as well as eCara. And so we hope that you can join us um, and please uh, share this information through 
uh, social media as well. Um, it's posted on our website or on our social media page, um, NCT COG Transportation on Facebook and NCT COG Trans on Twitter. And so it, just one other thing to highlight um, about this year, our National Driver Electric Week, um, Encore has a road rally that is going on currently. I think some of the cities on the call today may be participating in that, where EV owners um, travel through a city uh, through marked destination points. And, and so it's a, um, a contest that where everyone has to safely drive and they time themselves going through the um, the city's destination points and predetermined sites. And so we will be announcing the winners from each of those um, cities that are hosting road rallies at our event. Um, so I believe city of Dallas and South Lake who are on the call as well as um, Allen and, um, oh gosh, there's one more city in the region and I'm, oh goodness. Okay. Pointing to. <laughs> Maybe there's not. Maybe I'm thinking of Jacksonville, who's not in our region. But um, my apologies in advance if I just realized that. But just wanted to share that with everyone since it is coming up this Sunday. So, and um, Lori, thank you for posting the link Drive Electric DFW. That's where you can find our full slate of events, this being one of them. We're also having a workplace charging webinar tomorrow. Um, and um, Hope to see y'all this Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Soraya. Thank you, Lori. Um, so here's our contact information. You can also uh, join our DFW Queen Cities members and our mailing list here through texting uh, DFW Queen Cities to 22828. Um, is there any questions at this time? This is where we um, have dedicated the last 15 minutes or so to um, kind of a Q&A session. So feel free to um, ask any questions here. Bethany, I don't have any questions, but this is Britt Patel with the NCT COG Economic Development Department. And Lucille Johnson's here with me. We just wanna thank the COG transportation team and the BFW Clean Cities team and all the presenters today for this information on you know, for our economic development district, this information and all the economic benefits is just greatly, greatly beneficial. So we just want to say thank you for putting this together and for all this great information. Yeah, well, thank you for spreading the word. We we love to get more people involved. So yeah, and there may be an opportunity to do this again as we're trying to spread the word about the benefits of of communities really um, drawing economic benefits due to this program to the community. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for our presenters? Or any questions in general? <laughs> the recording will be available in about a week or so. Um, it'll be posted to our, our website at dfwcleancities.org slash events. Um, and that'll have the presentations there as well. And while we have everyone's time, um, we would love to also hear, you know, as we're providing this information, if there's any um, further content that you would like from us in the future, um, anything that piques your interest from today that you would like uh, more follow-up information on, please feel, do not hesitate to reach out to us or um, you can ask or make recommendations now. We would, um, Love to hear uh, feedback on how we're doing and how we can better serve your communities. Um, I, I wanted to, to share with everybody, I'm, and I apologize, I, I wasn't able to, to be on the first part of the webinar, but um, I know we talked about, you know, where areas where we need more infrastructure, where we have, where we have gaps, things like that. Uh, we actually, uh, last fall, um, the Electrify America, um, who will be who will be building additional stations, um, I believe it was it was mentioned that we had provided input to them. Part of that input included a list of highway exits where we, as Cog staff, had identified we need more charging stations at these specific exits. We didn't necessarily identify specific properties, um, but specific um, interstate, mostly interstate exits. 
So um, I'll put a link to those comments in the chat, um, and it's the, it's really the last three pages, but that may be something that certain communities can look at um, as just kind of an example. If you happen to have property or, or know of people who have property and are close to those locations, uh, that may be kind of a jumping off point for some conversations. And we do have, we can't endorse or recommend any particular EV charging station company, but we do have an extensive list of companies that are interested in building property or building stations around the region um, that we can provide. And I just wanted to last give a shout out to the cities of Allen, Dallas, Irving, Plano and South Lake in our region who are participating in the road rallies this year. Yes, the presentations we sent to attendees after. And it'll also be available on our website. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, well, I. Oh, oh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anyone have any questions? You feel free to unmute. Okay, well, for um, the sake of time, we can go ahead and, uh, and adjourn. Unless anyone has any further questions, please feel free to contact us um, by email or phone. Um, our contact information is listed here. So. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. And thank you, Pritt and Lucille, for coordinating this meeting for us today. This was a wonderful opportunity, and we hope to work with more of y'all soon. Thank you so much. We're, we're so grateful for this partnership. I'm excited. Yeah. Super, super. Thank you. This is really cool stuff. <laughs> well, thank you all. Y'all have a great week, and we hope to see you Sunday at National Drive Electric Week. Take care. Thanks.